Hi everyone, greetings again from Ganubi Baptist Church. It's Mark Morelia with a message from God's Word to help you and to encourage you today. No matter where you may be watching from, no matter what you may be going through, may God's Word speak powerfully into your life and situation today. Well, as you may or may not know, the man's family, the Morel family, is in quarantine because the two younger members um, tested positive for COVID this past week. Um, they're doing fine. Um, children seem to bounce back quickly from these things. They're busy with their schoolwork and just getting stronger each and every day. So thank you for your prayers for them and for us as a family. Um, I'd also encourage you to pray for others in our church family who have been affected by COVID over these recent days. Um, I'm sure that all value and appreciate your prayers and support. And God willing, within a short space of time, I'm hoping um, next Sunday we'll be back into the normal swing of things again with live services from the church. But as they say, watch this space. We will keep you updated. Well, friends, today we finish up with our series in the book of 1 John. And I hope you've thoroughly enjoyed the series. I've really been delighted to bring it to you. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've grown closer to Jesus and been challenged as we've gone through the book of 1 John together. But today we're going to wrap it up in 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. So if you've got your Bible available there, let's turn to 1 John chapter 5 and finish up the series by reading verses 13 to 21. 1 John chapter 5, 13 to 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of Him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come, and has given us understanding, so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Wonderful words, challenging words. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you again today for an opportunity to lay the cares, the worries, the busyness of the week aside. And in a sense, just to sit at your feet in worship and wonder and to allow your word to speak into our lives. Father, more than any uh, time before, we are facing incredibly challenging circumstances, living in a world full of uncertainty. And Lord, we need to be building our lives, every facet of our lives, upon the revelation of your word, the eternal truth of your word. And so, Lord, again today for every man and woman, every boy and girl who's watching this broadcast today, thank you that you love them so much. Thank you, Lord, that they are, are deeply treasured and loved by you. And I pray today, Lord, you'd have a special word for each and every person, a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a word of direction, that you would speak powerfully into our lives today, Father. Come, Holy Spirit, we are ready and waiting to hear from you. In the great name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, friends, I've entitled this week's final message in the series, Living with Certainty in an Uncertain World. I hope you like that title, Living with Certainty in an Uncertain World. And I've chosen that 
title because did you notice how often John uses the word no in these verses? Have a look at verse 13. That you may know that you have eternal life. Verse 15. We know that he hears us. Verse 18. We know that anyone born of God. Verse 19. We know that we are children of God. Verse 20. We know also that the Son of God has come. And again, we may know him who is true. In fact, John uses the word know 39 times in this short letter. Added to that, we also have the word confidence in verse 14. This is the confidence we have. Now, contrast that with the world in which we live. We live in a very uncertain world. Um, so many factors beyond our control which have the potential to influence and impact our lives. And I think COVID has highlighted over the past 80 months and really over the past week in our family, just how quickly and how suddenly things can change in life. And friends, if we're honest, that uncertainty can lead to a lot of anxiety and even fear. So many today are battling with anxiety, with worry, with fear over factors that they feel are beyond their control. All the uncertainty that makes up the world in which we live today. Questions regarding our health regarding our jobs, regarding our finances, regarding security, um, the economy, crime, uh, just to name a few areas where nothing seems to be certain. Um, even relationships, marriages, families, friendships have come under increasing strain in these uncertain days. A couple of weeks ago, I found myself up in Gauteng, and on the flight back from Johannesburg to East London, um, I got into conversation with the man sitting next to me, of course, rather um, uncomfortably through our masks. But he'd see me reading a book. The book was entitled The Man in the Mirror. I can highly recommend that book to you if you haven't read it. The Man in the Mirror. And we got into conversation um, re regarding the book. And eventually I asked the man a question. I said, do you think that we can be certain about anything in life. Can we be certain about anything? He thought about it, and then he replied, yes, one thing we can be certain about, and that is death. <laughs> that's what he said. In an uncertain world, that's the one thing we can be absolutely certain of. Death is the great enemy. We do everything possible to stay alive, but in the end, the great enemy always wins and we die. Well, then my follow-up question to the man was, and then what happens? What happens after we die? To which he quickly replied, well, I'm not sure. We can't be certain about that. <laughs> but as John nears the end of this particular letter, he wants to remind these early Christians, and I'm sure he'd want to remind us today, of some of the certainty, some of the guarantees that are ours in Christ Jesus. What are some of the historical, foundational truths that we can take to the bank, as it were? Remember, as followers of Jesus, we don't rely on subjective truth. In other words, the truth according to you, the truth according to me. Uh, the truth according to social media. No, no, we rely on objective truth. Truth that is outside of us. Truth that is independent of our opinion. Truth according to God. And the first certainty John highlights is found in verse 13. Have a look at it. He says, I write these things to you. <coughs> Excuse me. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So that you may know, there's the certainty, there's the key word, that you have eternal life. Eternal life, everlasting life has always been the great hope of the Christian faith. That's why the message is called the gospel, which means good news. In a world full of bad news, as Christ followers, we have a message of good news to share with the world. The Bible tells us that all have sinned 
and fallen short of the glory of God. Of course, that's Romans 3.23. And I don't think any one of us would argue with the Apostle Paul. We wouldn't debate that statement. We know that Paul is correct. We've all done things, said things, thought things that we shouldn't have done, said and thought. We know in our heart of hearts, Paul is correct. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then the Bible takes it a step further. The Bible goes on to say that the wages of sin, in other words, the, the result of sin, the consequence of sin, the end result of sin is death. Sin always leads to death. Physical death, yes, which is common to all men. But more importantly, spiritual death, which really means an eternal separation from the God of life. You see, that's the bad news. But the good news of the Bible is that there is one, Jesus Christ, who through his death and resurrection has defeated the great enemy, has conquered death. And now whoever believes in Jesus, how many times has John reminded us of that truth over the course of this series? Whosoever believes in Jesus, remember the Greek word there was pisteo. Pisteo means to rely on, to cling to, to trust in completely. Anyone who relies in Jesus, believes on Jesus, trusts in Jesus, hopes in Jesus, well that person shall never perish but have the guarantee, the promise of everlasting life. And I guess that's why the Apostle Paul could confidently declare, for me to live is Christ, but guess what? To die is gain. And history records that many of the early believers who experienced martyrdom under the hand of people like Nero went to their deaths shouting out, Viva Christo Rey, Viva Christo Rey, Viva Christo Rey, which means long live Christ the King, long live Christ the King. They could say that because they knew that death was not the end. Death was merely the doorway from this life into the presence of the living God, not for 70 or 80 years, but forever and ever and ever in his glorious presence. The certainty of everlasting life. Listen to the words of Job way back in the Old Testament. Some would say Job was the first book of the Bible ever written. Listen to the words of Job. He says, I know, there's that word again, not I guess, I think, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see God with my own eyes. I, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. The certainty in Job's heart of everlasting life. As a pastor over the years, I've had... You could say the privilege of sitting with many people on their, deaths, on their deathbeds as they prepare to transition from this life into the next. And one man I remember a couple of years ago, a dear man from our church by the name of Vernon. I was with him just as he was about to pass away. And I had one last chance to speak to him. I said, Vern, are you at peace? Are you ready? He was too weak to verbally reply, but... He just smiled from his hospital bed and he gave me the thumbs up. The thumbs up. In other words, Mark, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be with Jesus. I have the hope, the guarantee, the assurance of everlasting life. This is the great certainty of the Christian faith, eternal life. The second certainty that John highlights in these verses is also a very powerful one. And that is that God is a prayer answering God. Have a look at verse 14. John writes, this is the confidence. There's that word again. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Friends, I've been so reminded in these 
difficult and challenging times, the last year to 18 months, reminded again and again and again about the power of prayer. And I've developed a motto, and that motto is, pray more, worry less. <laughs> There's a good one to maybe write on your fridge or to at least keep in the back of your mind. Pray more, worry less. Somebody said, when man works, man works. But when man prays, God works. There's something about prayer that releases the power of God into lives and situations and circumstances. I've been reminded um, over and over again of the words of Jesus in John 15 verse 7. Just listen to the power of these words. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Are those not powerful, powerful words? Now, there are two keys that John highlights in these verses when it comes to prayer. And I'm sure you, you spotted them as I read the verses to you. Number one, answered prayer is linked to praying according to God's will. That's what John said. If we pray anything according to the will of God, he will answer us. And in John 15, verse 7, John adds another key to the equation. He says, abiding in Jesus, remaining close to Jesus, is another key in terms of answered prayer. By the way, as you look back on your life, this is just a, a throw in here. Aren't you grateful that God didn't answer some of the prayers you prayed? <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> I'm so grateful God saw fit to say no to some of the things I thought were good at the time. At the time, we thought we knew what we wanted. We thought we knew what we needed. But with the benefit of hindsight, we realized that God, in His wisdom, God who saw the bigger, complete picture, He knew better than us. And so, friends, in an uncertain world, let's be committed to praying more and worrying less. Suddenly you find yourself facing the same set of circumstances, you're facing the same challenges, but you're facing them from a place of peace, perspective and confidence rather than worry, anxiety and fear. Pray more, worry less. Verse 16 and 17 are very interesting, you might even say strange verses, because John in those verses speaks about sin leading to death. And he speaks about sin not leading to death. And he says we should pray for those living in sin, not leading to death, that God would grant them life. So I guess the question is then, what is the sin leading to death? Well, that would be the ultimate rejection of Jesus Christ. A rejection of the cross, a rejection of everything the cross represents, and John says that ultimate rejection of Jesus, that ultimate rejection of the cross will lead to physical death, yes, but more importantly, spiritual death and eternal separation from the God of life. That's why the Bible says, friends, today is the day of salvation. If you hear God's voice today, the Bible says, do not harden your heart for the tomorrow you may be thinking about. That tomorrow is not guaranteed. And you don't want to play a Russian roulette with your eternal future. But John is encouraging us in these verses to pray for those who are still alive. Family, uh, friends, work colleagues. Um, pray for those who are still alive. Those who have opportunity to turn from sin and to turn to Jesus. Look what he says there in verse 16. He says, you should pray and God will give them life. Some of you, maybe many of you who are, are watching today, you are followers of Jesus today. Why? Because somebody refused to give up on praying for you. Somebody persevered in prayer for you and now it's your chance to do the same for somebody else. I love the story of Operation Mobilization, the organization that Paul and I were part of for many years. Operation Mobilization traces its roots back to the prayers of a housewife. In the 1950s, Dorothea Clapp 
began to pray faithfully for the students in her local high school. She asked God to touch the world through their young lives. Mrs. Clapp's son gave the Gospel of John to one of the students who later surrendered his life to Jesus at a Billy Graham meeting. That young man's name was George Verva, the founder and former international director of Operation Mobilization. Today, Operation Mobilization comprises some 3,100 people representing over 100 nationalities, bringing the hope of Jesus to literally millions of people all around the world. Why? Because one ordinary housewife chose to pray for high school students. Friends, let's be committed to praying. Why? Because John says God is a prayer answering God. Well, we have certainty of eternal life. We have certainty that God answers prayer. But then number three, John says we have certainty that we have victory over sin. Victory over sin. Have a look at verse 18. He says, we know that anyone born of God, anyone born of the Spirit, does not continue to sin. No one born of God, no one who's experienced the spiritual rebirth, the spiritual rejuvenation, just carries on living selfishly and sinfully. No, Ephesians 2 verse 4 and 5 says, But God, but God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead, there's a powerful word, dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. What a powerful verse. Paul says, we have come alive in our spirit man. It's almost like God turned the lights on. Remember, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people live again. God has given us a new heart. He has given us the power of His Holy Spirit that will manifest in a life that delights to walk in the ways of God, a heart that delights to do the will of God. And of course, John reminds us that when we do sin, John, uh, that's in chapter 1 and verse 9, that when we do sin, he has a promise to hold on to, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How beautiful, how powerful are those words. Not just forgiven, John says, but cleansed. No more guilt, no more shame, no more condemnation. Washed in the blood of Jesus. As the songwriter reminds us, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and shame, lose all their guilt and shame. Certain that we have eternal life, certain that God is a prayer answering God, certain that we have victory over sin, and finally in 60 seconds, certain that Christ is the true and the living God. Have a look at verse 20. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. Listen, He is the true God and He is eternal life. Wow. Remember how John began the letter in the very first verse of the very first chapter. He said, we saw Jesus, we heard Jesus, we even touched Jesus and he ends the letter exactly the same way he began by pointing us, by pointing us to Jesus. Don't get sidetracked by peripheral things. Don't get sidetracked by lesser gods, idols, he says there in verse 21. Oh no, love Jesus, follow Jesus, live for Jesus, worship Jesus. He is the true and the living God, and He is eternal life. Friends, I ask you to bow your head with me as I close off in prayer, and I want to do that by just reading 
and speaking this powerful scripture over your lives as we prepare to face the challenges of the coming week. Won't you just receive these words as you sit there in your home and may they find a place deep in your hearts today. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, able to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Friends, what a joy to have brought that word to you. I hope you were greatly encouraged. And as we journey through these uncertain days, keep those eyes fixed on Jesus. God bless, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Amen.